there was a quiet tap on my shoulder. At first I thought it was my wife, but then I remembered that it was late Monday night, and the tapping was coming from someone else. I rolled over. It was Verena Jefferson, the wife and co-owner of the antique store where I bought the furniture. She was smiling at me. Wake up, sleepyhead, she whispered. It's four o'clock in the afternoon. My husband will be back soon, and I have to reopen the store. I half jumped up from the old couch. Farina, I, we, not now, sweetie. Jump in the shower. You can't come home to mommy all steamed up, can you? Farina, listen. No, not now. I need to go outside before my husband gets back. After you dry off and get dressed, just slip out the back door. I'll see you on Thursday. Don't forget. Without giving me a chance to respond, she closed the back door and slipped out into the street. Jesus, I thought. What have I gotten myself into? All I wanted was to surprise my wife with something for her birthday. Marcia, my wife, loves antiques, and Jefferson's store had exactly what I wanted. An antique chair set, actually a chair and two stools that looked to be hundreds of years old. I had to admit that Verena was still a piece of work. Six feet tall, short black hair, dark skin, probably around 40, great smell. She lured me right into the house. This was my second visit to their store. Last week, I'd walked in and found two chairs. Farina told me about the matching love seat. She said they had it elsewhere, in a small warehouse. She was so, how should I put it? So seductive. Those eyes, those black, so alluring eyes. She smiled at me. She led me into the back room to look at a picture, and within seconds I was on the couch and then an old bed for two. I knew. I was stupid. Like the old saying goes, a man doesn't have enough blood to feed both heads. It's either one or the other. I picked up the chairs afterward and loaded them into my Ford Explorer. But she said the couch needed some additional repairs, and I should come back again. I went back. The chair still wasn't ready. She called me a second time. Now I have to come back on Thursday. I can't do that. Verena thinks she's got a playmate. But if I don't come back on Thursday, I won't get the couch. And if I do, what will I do? I'm a happily married man. I'm Catholic. I love my wife, Marcia and I. We have four children. I've been faithful to her like an old dog, at least until... And now what? I must go home. The drive was long and tedious. First out of town where Jefferson's store was, then down the freeway to the interstate, and finally down Highway 12 to our village and home. I had a lot on my mind. What was I going to do? I just knew. Sooner or later, Marcia would suspect something. I felt awful. What's wrong with me? I'm a good guy. I have a great wife, a bunch of great kids. Marsha's the best. Marsha was always one of a kind. Let me tell you, I didn't just meet Marsha and fall in love. I found her. It was a complete accident. I had to almost force her to agree to meet me. Marsha was raised in the strictest sense of the word Catholic. In a family of six siblings, Marsha had chosen to serve her religion. When I first encountered her, she had already been accepted into one of the regional orders. She had already completed a two-year candidacy program. If I had shown up a couple months later, she would have already been a novice. Then I wouldn't stand a chance. I ran into her one day by dumb luck. Luck? Bad luck? No, the greatest of luck. In retrospect, I think, what a marvelous happy coincidence. No, a real act of God. I got a phone number. I don't even remember who gave it to me. I was 21 years old and still in college. I called. We talked. We called each other back. She seemed very nice. Sweet, innocent, not my style at all. Yeah, but I was Romeo. No, I really was. I was proud of how many I could and had already talked into bed. This one seemed to be easy meat. I remembered her saying she had just graduated and was preparing for a life in the service. To me then, given who I was, that meant something like she wanted to be a prostitute. We agreed to meet at the traffic circle at the end of the bus line near where she lived. I drove up, saw her, and almost immediately hesitated. I stopped, honked, got out of the car, and opened the passenger side door. She slipped inside. As soon as I sat down and got a good look at her, I realized it was a damn mistake. A big mistake. She had a damn hair lip. Pulling away from the curb, even now I remember wondering, how the hell am I going to get out of this? We didn't get far. My awkwardness and her shyness took over. She asked if I could stop. I stopped. She jumped out of the car and started walking and then running sort of sprinting like girls in long coats do. My first reaction was relief, but then something else came up. Regret. Remorse. Guilt. 
I jumped out of the car, nearly ripping the driver's door off of another motorist. I ran out onto the sidewalk and yelled, Hey, wait up! She was already running. I was faster. I caught up to her, grabbed her by the shoulders, turned her around very roughly, and in a voice that somehow got an octave higher, yelled, Hey, wait! What? Damn, she was crying. I didn't know what to do, so I pulled her to me and hugged her. I still remember how I held her very skinny body against me. Damn, she's flat as a board. I remember her wriggling, but I held on. I put the palm of my right hand on the back of her head, and she became still. Rigid. She was so small. It was our first contact, and after all, it had been over 15 years. Since then, it had been one of the craziest courtships imaginable. I couldn't explain it then. I can't explain it now. There was something, something or someone there that I needed, that I had to have. I longed, I pursued, I chased, I chased, I begged. Did she have parents? Oh, brother. Did she have parents? She had four older brothers, an older sister, grandparents, the whole extended family, and they all guarded her passionately. I couldn't have dreamed of anything like that. It took me months. It was a long, grueling campaign. But in the end, I led her down the aisle. That's a whole other story, and I don't want to think about it. Not now. My stomach twisted into a knot. I'd broken my most solemn vow. She'll find out. She'll guess. I know she'll realize it. She'll see it. I'm finished. God, what a fool I've been. I got home. I pulled into the garage and made sure no one looked under the tarp where I'd hidden the chairs. I warned Marcia not to look, but kids. Well, childish curiosity. I fiddled with the tarp for a while and then got up and went into the house. We have an attached garage connected to the main house through the laundry room, then a small foyer, and then the kitchen. I heard Marcia. She was humming softly. Sounded like something from Abba. It smelled like something delicious. Spaghetti. Maybe lasagna. The house was warm, homey, cozy, as it always was. The way a house should be. A real home. Marcia turned to me as I entered. She had a plate of homemade lasagna in her hands. She looked beautiful. Brown culottes, a white apron tied in the back with a bow, a beige button-up blouse, her hair in a ponytail, small hands, dainty little fingers, clear nail polish. Marcia rarely used makeup. She didn't need it. Long lashes framed lush green eyes, bright red hair framed a perfect heart-shaped face. Her lips tightened as she spoke, the last trace of cleavage almost imperceptible, at least to me. It's almost ready. The salad is on the table. Garlic bread is just coming. She set the tray of lasagna on the counter and lifted herself up on tiptoes for a kiss. I had to look away. Something smells good, I said. Just took a shower, she replied. I blushed. Could she have meant? No, she meant she'd taken a shower. I grinned. No, with food. She pulled back. You're a fool. I meant me. And remember, I taped our show last night. After dinner, we'll put the kids to bed, curl up and watch it. She pushed me aside. Don't be so weird. Get the garlic bread and bring it over. Like a hummingbird, she swept past me into the dining room. Just as I approached the oven, the cattle piled in. Jamie was the first to enter, a born leader, built like a horse. Second was ten-year-old Wilson, followed by seven-year-old Alan, a clone of his older brothers. Last was five-year-old Meadow. All the boys looked like me, big, strong-built with brown hair. Meadow looked like her mom, petite, red-haired, freckled, and shy. As always, I squeezed past the boys and picked up my daughter. How's my baby girl today? She wrapped her arms around my neck. I love you, Daddy. Looking around, she added, Did you bring me anything? The boys rushed to the table. Wilson shouted, Come on, let's eat! Jamie yelled back at him, Mom, first! We all stood back and waited for Marcia, the queen of the kingdom, to take her seat. It was like this every night. The boys are rowdy and boisterous. Mito is quiet and, as they call her, soft and gentle. Everyone knew she was kind of my favorite, but no one cared. After all, I had my boys. They were there for me like their mom was there for me. Baseball league, soccer, lacrosse, fights with our dog. I was the dad. Oh, the dog. I almost forgot. We have a yellow Labrador named Brandy. Brandy technically belongs to Marcia, but I always take her to the vet, clean up the crap in the backyard, and walk her when she leaves the yard. Brandy is seven years old. We would all sit around the table, listen to mom say a prayer, and then get to work. Marcia's a great cook, the best. God, I adore her so much. I looked from her to my boys. 
How could someone so tiny create such big kids? I thought of Varen. What a woman. How could... What was I? After eating dinner, we helped the kids with their homework. I helped Meadow with words. Mom helped the boys with math. We put the kids to bed. Ma Marcia and I made ourselves comfortable and started watching our show, another Hallmark. What else is there to watch for a woman who has almost become a nun? For two hours, we cuddled on the couch. After the movie, we'd go to bed, but anything more was off limits. We're Catholics, mind you. No diaphragms, no pills, just the natural order of life. By 11 o'clock, Marcia curled up and fell asleep. I lay hugging my beloved and looking up at the ceiling. I had to call Verena. No more. I'm serious. No more. I got up early. I had to get to the office, then to court. I was involved in a rather important case. An unmarried mother's baby was improperly treated during a medical emergency. The hospital thought they could get away with it. They didn't. The case was a big one. Lots of money. I don't chase ambulance chasers, but the hospital was negligent. They got what they deserved. I knew the tune. The local radio thugs derided it as just another frivolous lawsuit. Besides, they all always had insurance. That poor dumb mom had nothing, nothing, until our law firm stepped in. The talking heads may have ranted about rising insurance premiums, hospital shortages, and outrageous malpractice fees, but this mother and her child had rights. After a day in court, I tried to call Verena, but the phone went to voicemail. I needed that couch, but I certainly didn't want to socialize with this woman again. I had a wife and a family. I was a happy man. Verena was a mistake. We've been to court again. We're going to win it. I couldn't reach Verena. Guess I'll clear it up when I go to pick up the couch tomorrow. Checked my watch. Three o'clock. Haven't gotten through to Verena's car yet. I pulled into the alley behind the antique store, got out of the car, and walked to the back door. I knocked. A gentleman appeared on the doorstep. Are you Gary Blackwell, here for the couch? Yes, sir, I replied. That's me. The Jeffersons are not here, but they left us to help you with your purchase. Another man came through the door. He was carrying my couch. Where do you want it? I led him to the back of my car, opened the back door, and he slid it inside. The first man stepped forward with a clipboard. Sign here, please. I signed and nodded my thanks. As I headed for the driver's door, the second man said, Oh, one more thing. He punched me in the stomach with his fist. The second man grabbed me by my tie and threw me against the still unopened door. He pulled my sports jacket down around my arms so I couldn't resist, and in his most serious voice said, Mr. Jefferson has a message for you. Using my tie and shirt collar as weapons, he headbutted me two, no, three times into the side door. Another man, using his fists, punched me in the chest. I fell to the ground. And he was about to hit me again when the first man pulled him back. No, we're just going to jerk him around a bit. Give him the envelope. The second man tossed me the manila envelope, and the first man opened my car door. Together, they pushed me inside. The first man said, Now get out of here. I felt sick. My head was splitting and my chest was pounding. My pants and shirt were torn. I wet myself. I didn't waste a second. I put the key in the ignition, started my SUV, unlocked the emergency brake, and sped off. I drove as fast as I could, pulled out of the alley and raced down the street until I felt I was far away from those people in the store. I pulled over to the curb and, breathing hard, opened the manila folder. No. God, no. I should have known. A store like that downtown? In a neighborhood like that? Of course it was being watched. Mr. Jefferson, protecting himself from possible burglars, had equipped every room, including the back room, with surveillance equipment. I looked at myself and Verena Jefferson. She was sitting on my lap. Of course, it was only a photograph, but there could be no doubt. Next, in a manila envelope, I discovered a DVD. I didn't need to explain anything. How could I have been so stupid? Sat I sank down on the steering wheel and burst into tears. This can't be. What was I thinking? Then it hit me. What if? Oh no. God no. Tell me it's not. I had to go home. Oh, Marcia. What now? What can I say? She never... Oh God. Oh God. My kids. My wife. My family. I've ruined everything. Please, please, please. I, I drove as fast as I could. I needed a story. Okay. I stopped at 7-Eleven for coffee and one guy, no, two guys tried to steal my car. I fought them off. This could work. I drove home pulled right into the garage, got out, took a deep breath, it hurt, and entered through the laundry room as I always do. I could smell dinner, roast beef, 
One of my favorites, whatever. Look at me. What have I done? When I walked into the kitchen, Masha saw me. She rushed to me. Gary, what's wrong? Let me get your coat. She turned toward the dining room and called, Jamie Wilson, get in here, now. Another second and my two older boys were by my side, helping me up the stairs. Alan stood at the portal and looked at me. Meadow, standing behind him, looked terrified. Marcia, standing directly behind the boys, asked, Who did this? I'll call the police. I muttered, A carjacking. No worries. Silently, my boys helped me to our bedroom. Marcia was in the bathroom, wetting and wringing out a few towels. She looked at Jamie. Downstairs. Turn off the oven. Have your brothers and sisters set up in the living room. Thank God there's Jamie, I thought. Marcia pulled a blanket over me. I'll get you cleaned up. Where does it hurt? It looks like you've been kicked. God, Gary, we need to get you to an ambulance. No, I'll be fine. I'll just get some rest. She looked down skeptically. Gary, oh, Gary, because of the car? You could have been killed. She knelt down beside me, tears in her eyes. It was so stupid. Oh, sweetie, oh, my darling. She pressed her hand to my cheek. She leaned down and kissed me. I felt like shit. The doorbell rang. I heard it. Marcia heard it, too. Downstairs, one of the boys must have opened it, and a second later, Jamie called upstairs. It was some man. He left a folder. He said it was for you, Mom. Marcia stayed by my side but called downstairs. Did you thank the man? Bring whatever is in there down here. I flinched, but not from the beating. Marcia wiped my forehead with her fingertips. Oh, honey, we need to get you to the hospital. Jamie walked in with a folder. He held it out to my mom. I knew what was in there. My mind kept screaming, Put it down! Don't open it! Marcia must have read my mind. She put the envelope on the nightstand. I breathed a sigh of relief. Unless. If she didn't open it, if she left it on the nightstand, maybe I could get it later. Marcia leaned over to me and gently pressed her thin hand against my cheek. She kissed me. Try to get comfortable while I take care of the kids. I'll take you to the hospital. And standing up, she turned to the envelope. A curious expression appeared on her face. This is addressed to me. She touched it lightly. It looks official. I felt like shouting, Stop! She picked up the envelope and headed for the door, opening it as she went. She turned to our son Jamie. Jamie, I... And stopped halfway through opening the envelope. She turned to me again, motionless as stone. The expression on her face. I knew. Marcia, I... My wife reached back and quietly closed the bedroom door. She slowly walked over to the bed and sat on its footboard. She nervously rubbed the envelope. She looked at me. No tears, no anger, just tears. With a face as gray as death, she whispered, Who is she? No one. I... She's the woman from whom I bought the chairs and sofa. I mean... She fell silent. She just looked from me to what I now realized was my death sentence. Despite the pain in my side, I made my way over to her. I enclosed her in my arms. It was a mistake. I made a mistake. Marcia didn't resist. She muttered, She's old. She looks old. Finally, she looked up at me. Gary, why? I tried to sound comforting. It didn't work. I don't know, dot, 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 it just happened. Marcia rested her head on my shoulder, then leaned back. Still looking at those horrible pictures, she whispered, We need to get you to the hospital. Avoiding eye contact, she stood up, turned to the door, opened it again, and called downstairs. Jamie, I'm taking Daddy to the hospital. Be a man and keep an eye on things while we're gone. She slid over to the bureau, closed the envelope in the top drawer, turned to me, and breathing deeply said, Please put something on. I'm taking you to the hospital. I was at a complete loss. This was Marcia in classic caregiver mode. Honey, I, please. She didn't look at me. She took a step toward the door. I'll be downstairs. And slipped through the door, leaving it ajar. I got dressed and followed her. The trip to the hospital passed in silence. By the time we were done, it was past midnight. I had one broken rib and a few minor bruises. Nothing major. When we got home, Jamie was still awake, but everyone else was in bed, not asleep, just lying in bed. In the living room, Marcia, stroking our boy's shaggy head, said, That's my man. I added, Good boy, now let's go with you. Before he left, he asked, Are you okay, Daddy? I replied, I'm fine. He looked at Mom. Are you? Go to bed, Jamie. We have school tomorrow. Marcia was a volunteer at St. Timothy's where our children went. 
We chose St. Timothy's because it was one of the few co-ed church parochial schools in our area. She played piano and helped with the preschoolers. She looked at me. You go to bed too. I'll get up later. I needed her to be with me. Marcia, she replied, just go to bed. She didn't get up. The next morning when I came downstairs, she was already in the kitchen, packing lunches, getting things ready for our kids and frying me eggs. When I walked in, she handed me my coffee, set a plate of fried eggs on the table and asked, how's it going? I took a sip of my coffee. Good. I think we're going to win. And then asked, do you have any plans? Besides school, I mean. She leaned her back against the sink. I think I'll stop by mom and dad's later. I tried to restrain myself, but inwardly shuddered. Marcia's father was a retired police officer, Captain Keith Fitzgerald. His two sons had followed him into the police force. Her mom was a classic Irish housewife. They loved all their children, but Marcia was always special. The last of their brood, a late baby born a little prematurely, with her special distinction. She was to be their gift to God. That was until she agreed to marry me. They were kind to us, especially to me. They loved our children as much as any other grandchildren. But Marcia's decision to marry was a disappointment to them. A small disappointment, but a disappointment nonetheless. And I knew deep down they resented me. Her father had never trusted me. Her brothers and mom had tolerated me politely. Only her sister. And now this? I whispered. Honey, maybe? No, she said. I have to see mom and dad. Okay, I said. All morning in court, I was in a daze. My co-workers noticed it, but I had another problem. She'd talk to her parents, get some advice. God, I hoped. And still I needed to think. To think about something. I got home a little after six. I'd brought flowers. Marcia had another roast in the oven. You could see that she had been crying. The kids were upstairs, doing homework or playing, I hoped. Marcia tried to smile. How did it go today? I replied. We caught them. They know it too. They'll fight for a while longer, but now it's more a question of how much and for how long. Gary, she said. Yes, honey? Would you mind if I slept downstairs for a few nights? Oh, Marcia. No, I need to be alone. I mean, get away for a few nights. I have a lot on my mind. I replied. No, I'll sleep downstairs. The bed will stay with you. She leaned to her left. I heard a faint whimper. No, it's the bed. I mean, I need to sleep here. I nodded. Okay, if you say so. She replied. Yes. Dinner that night was somber. The kids realized something was wrong. Meadow's eyes looked big and juicy. The boys shifted their gaze from me to mom and then back to me. Marcia spent that first night on the living room couch, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next, and the next. Dinner time was getting worse and worse. I didn't know what to do, but I had to do something. I took a Saturday afternoon and drove to Marcia's parents' house. Her mother saw me and disappeared into the kitchen. Mr. Fitzgerald invited me into the dining room. Well, Gary, what do you have to say for yourself? She told you. He nodded. Mr. Fitzgerald, I made a mistake. I can't explain it. I can't fathom what I did. But I know it was the stupidest thing I've ever done in my life. I'm so sorry. I know I hurt her. I just don't know what to do. His face expressed nothing. But then out of left field came. She went to see a lawyer. No. I... No. I mean... We... She couldn't have. Her father replied quietly. Gary, she's terrified. I've never seen her like this. Divorces. Not that but her lawyer mentioned something like a separation agreement. You have to move out. I was at a loss for words, crushed, not by Marcia, not by my Marcia, not by this. Mr. Fitzgerald, I need your help. Tell me what to do. His answer was like ice. You have to move out. I felt he was on edge. One more word from me and I would be on the floor. I replied, I'll do whatever she wants, but she, you should know. It was, it will never happen again. He gritted his teeth. Emotions were pressing down on him like cracks in a crumbling wall. Lowering his gaze, he barely audibly muttered, Don't ever do that again. And then looked up at me. He looked old. I stared at him in despair. You broke her heart. To her you were... He shook his head. Go away. Just go. Go home. Yes, sir, I said. I stood up, turned toward the door and walked outside. Mrs. Fitzgerald was standing on the porch waiting for me. She came over and touched my arm. Never noted for her dickish speech, she began. 
Gary? Marsha? She... Well, not... Ever? She... It's her... You know... History. You know... You... We... Uh... You weren't like... Others. You know... You know... People? You were... And her. Oh, Gary, you know what I mean? She was shaking, tears streaming down her face. Gary? You. Go home, Gary. Marsha's just... You have to make things right. I realized what she meant. I walked down the steps and got in the car. I thought back to that first time. I remembered Marsha. That first time. I remember I didn't think she was beautiful. Not beautiful at all. Those lips, her nose. It was all wrong. I held the back of her head in my hand. I used her hair to lift her head. Eyes, green eyes, red hair. No, she was beautiful. Very beautiful. If only I didn't have to look at that damn lip, her left lip. Yeah, that's what was wrong. That wicked red line from her lips to her nose just drew my gaze, distracted me from everything else. Freckles, cheeks, hair, my God, that hair and those eyes. I took my gaze away and looked into her eyes. God, she was looking at me and she knew. So you're Marsha. She started squirming again. Okay, you've had enough, so let me go. No way, do you remember my name? Gary, Gary something. Blackwell, scumbag Blackwell. She began to wriggle even harder. I didn't let her go. Yes, that's me, Gary the scumbag. So when can I ask you out? I thought, have I lost my mind? Then she really twitched. If you don't let go, I'm going to scream. Still not letting go of her, I said. Look, I can't do that. How about you agree to let me take you to McDonald's? We'll get a burger or something. It's the least you us can do. We'll talk for a while and then I'll drop you off. So how about it? Why would you want to do that? You see, I loosened my grip a little and she seemed to relax. Yeah, I can see that. But on the phone, when we talked on the phone, I thought we were getting along. She replied, that was a mistake. I got angry. I remember thinking, what the hell? If any of my friends see me with her shit. I said, look, I'm not asking you to marry me. It's just a damn burger for Christ's sake. She flinched. Not only are you a creep, you're also a foul-mouthed freak. She had me figured out. I was probably the last worst person to be seen with her. Not just me with her, but she with me. I really was a worthless piece of shit. Looking at her, and her at me, I realized what a piece of shit I was. I said, okay, I apologize. I used a bad word. Now how about this? A lousy Coke and that's it. Then I'll drop you off. She agreed. Okay just a soda. I walked her to her car. All the way there, I thought about my best friend, or almost best friend, who had recently died in a car accident. He was driving a stingray and ran a red light. He hit a pole. They say the damn thing just exploded. His body was a mess. I was the casket bearer at the closed casket. Yeah, but I wasn't thinking about his death. I was thinking about what I'd agreed to. A good friend of mine had a girlfriend. She really loved him, but he knocked her up. She didn't want an abortion. She wanted to get married. He didn't say yes or no. Then he got to thinking. He started reaching out to his buddies, guys like me. One by one, we agreed that if he told her no, and she pressed him on it, we'd all say we'd entertained her too. My friend decided she would look like a slut if we all did that, and she backed off. No one thought about DNA back then. It was 1998, and we were too stupid. He even figured she might get so upset she'd kill herself. Anyway, my buddy thought his problem would be solved. But instead, he was murdered. That's the kind of guy I was. The kind of guy who would lie about a nice girl to get a no-good friend out of a bad situation. That was 1998. I was older now, and I walked this hair slut to the car to take her to McDonald's. I said McDonald's, so we didn't have to get out of the car. There was no way I wanted to be seen with her. Heck, if this was 1998, I probably would have laughed at her and called her some stupid name, and then laughed even harder if she cried. Heck. I could have done that a couple months ago, but now? No, probably not. So we went to McDonald's. Later that afternoon, back to today. When I got home, Marsha was in the kitchen. I smelled something. Probably oysters. I walked in and immediately realized that she knew I was at her father's house. I sat down in the chair. I saw your father. I know. He called me. I didn't know you went to see a lawyer. Marsha sat for what seemed like ten minutes, crying but controlling herself and told me, I talked to Helen. They have a room if you want it. You want me to move out? Helen's house is close by. I can drop the kids off. 
You can come over when I'm not home. My stupid pride took over. No, I'd rather... Marcia interrupted. No, Helen's house is a good place. You'll be around if I or any of the kids need you. I might want to stop by and see you. It will be good for Helen, too. I understood. I was out, but not all the way. I replied, Helen and I always got along, and after Brian died, she was pretty much on her own. I guess I could go there and then be here if anything happened. Helen was Marcia's closest sister. Her husband Brian had died of Hodgkin's disease quite some time ago, and she still hadn't come to terms with it. She had a little boy, Marion, not even five, a good kid, missing his father. Puzzled, I added, Marcia, we don't have to do this. Couldn't we? She interrupted me again. No, it's better this way. You have to go to Helen. When do you want me to go? Tonight after dinner. What about the kids? They already know. Jesus said to the children, What if I stay tonight and leave after Mass tomorrow? No, tonight. I needed help. I needed someone I could talk to. I needed advice. I replied, I guess so. Marcia stood up and turned to the pan standing over the oven. We're going to have one of your favorite dishes, fried oysters. That's exactly how I felt. Fried oysters? And even more so. How nice. Dinner was fun. No one said anything. After we ate, the kids disappeared. Marcia must have told them to hide somewhere after dinner. I cleaned the skillet while Marcia loaded the dishwasher. I had to say something. I ended up saying the same thing I'd said before. Marcia, this doesn't mean anything. I know. Honey, it didn't mean anything. I don't know how it happened. It was just like nothing. I can't explain it. You already told me. Honey, do I have to leave? Do I really have to leave? Yes. Marcia, please? Helen is a good place. I stood there. I couldn't cry. I didn't want to cry. I refused to cry. I started to cry. Marcia finished loading the dishwasher. It's time for you to pack your clothes. I've washed everything. Don't forget the toiletries. Helen knows you're coming over. Oh, and leave the house key on the table. The house key? Leave it on the table. You won't need it. Besides, you know where we've hidden the spare key. If there's an emergency, you'll have it handy. But my house key? My key? Just leave it. What choice did I have? She had me. She had the pictures. I didn't deny anything. She wanted me to leave. It made sense. The kids needed her more than they needed me. All I did was pay the bills and serve as a playmate. Anyway, she wasn't going to divorce me, at least not completely anyway. Just break up. We would live separately. I would be cut off from her, from my children, from my life. It couldn't be, but it was. After dinner, I left. Next chapter. The first few days were horrible. As I left, I thought, she said I could come to her house every night but not come to dinner. I could either come before or after. I chose after. I thought maybe we could make it work, but it didn't. Marcia would just go to her room while I was there. Those nights were awful. Meadow cried when I came over and cried when I left. Jamie wouldn't talk to me. Wilson and Alan did the same thing he did. After the first few times, the boys just went upstairs with their mom, and Meadow and I were left alone. How many times can you watch Frozen? Helen was good to me. She was still lonely. Her little boy needed someone. She put me in the spare bedroom. Brian was a good provider. She had good life insurance, paid off her mortgage, better health care. With the part-time job she was getting, plus social security for Marion, Helen could make ends meet. With me coming in, she would have extra help around the house. I, fearing what Marcia might do, tried not to be too generous in giving money to Helen. But still, I helped. The days seemed to stretch on. Helen and I talked a little. In fact, we talked a lot. No, we really talked. She didn't ask a lot of questions, but she talked. She told me that Marcia was definitely going to get a divorce. Helen said that Marcia just can't get her head around what I did. Helen said she cries almost all the time. We talked about other things, too. Marcia was the youngest of six children. Before Marcia, Helen was the baby. Marcia's unexpected birth combined with her disfigurement threw the Fitzgerald family into turmoil. Helen first told me that when her sister first arrived, she hated her. She was a baby, and then suddenly she was another baby. One evening, as Helen and I were shortening our time together, she told me what had happened. Helen decided that her parents felt guilty, first for having what they thought were too many children, and then for their last child being so ugly. Helen said she realized later, her parents never wanted Marcia, and when she came along she was so spoiled. I had seen the pictures before, but Helen showed them to me again. 
They were horrible, my poor Marcia. Helen went on about other things I never knew about. Although Mr. Fitzgerald was a policeman and they had terrific insurance, it never seemed to cover everything. They were doing pretty well with five kids. But then along came Marcia, the problem, and money. Apparently, Marcia had options for surgery, and there were several. The Fitzgeralds were offered some pretty stark choices. They could do this, and she'd be very good, or that, and she'd be not so good. The difference always came down to money. The Fitzgeralds had to make tough choices, and Marcia was just a kid, and a primmy besides. There were never any guarantees. And here I am. At work, the case involving the single mom and her toddler was going well. The other cases weren't causing much stress. I couldn't sleep. When and where would I be served? What will I be doing? Would she even do it? Or maybe she wouldn't. It was Marcia, for heaven's sake. She wouldn't like to hear that, to use the Lord's name in that way. So what am I doing? Sen I talked to a friend of mine who dealt with such matters. He was not helpful. He said that no matter what, I would be judged. He warned me that if Marcia forced me to serve at work, it would be tantamount to the kiss of death. About this time, Helen came to me and said she wanted to talk to me. It was a tense conversation, and it darkened things for a few days. Now, Helen caught me in her laundry room as I was fixing a clogged siphon. Gary, can I ask you a question? I immediately paused. Sure, anything. Except for that time at, well, at the antique store, have you ever done anything, you know? No, Helen, never. Never even thought about it. Then why Gary? I was suddenly very nervous. Was Helen asking me this because Marcia wanted to know? Of course she was asking. I stood up and put down the pipe wrench. For some reason I felt scared. What could I say? What if I said the wrong thing? I knew I had to be honest. If I lied or said something stupid and Helen told Marcia she would understand. I replied, I don't know why. I just don't. I suppose I could say I was tired or loaded with work or somehow angry about something, but none of those things were true. I was actually feeling pretty good, even chipper, at least a little bit. Was this woman some kind of siren? No, she was perfectly ordinary. On the street, I wouldn't have paid the slightest attention to her. I just remember thinking how Marcia would like the chairs. And then this woman was on top of me. It all happened. It all started so fast. Believe me, Helen, if I'd known, if I'd had the answer, I would have... Well, Helen shrugged. Okay. Then, after more thought, she added and thanks for fixing the S-trap, and left. Looking back, again, I think back to Marcia and me, our courtship, that first date. Marcia was pretty ordinary, too. Well, the lips, that ugly red line, and the nose not quite, well. Our first date wasn't really a date. We went to McDonald's that day. We talked for over an hour. Once I got over her thing, Marcia turned out to be really interesting. For someone with similar problems, she had a melodic voice a little chirpy. She reminded me of a hummingbird. She told me she was going to become a nun. I was Catholic and had socialized with nuns, but I never thought of them as real people. They were either unsociable or overly malleable and tacky, but that was probably about me. In a way, I could see Marcia becoming a nun. She'd never have to worry about dating and boyfriends and stuff, but that first day I thought she shouldn't be a nun. Even then, as a troglodyte, I think I saw her as a mother. We talked, but instead of just dropping her off, I offered to drive her home. Wow, what a mistake that was. Mr. and Mrs. Fitzgerald had a schedule, and Marcia was running late. Silly me, I walked her to the door. She got to the door and her father opened it. Mr. Fitzgerald opened his door, smiled at Marcia, and looked at me. Looking at her, he said, You're late. Who's that? First day, first trip to the house, and I discovered that little Miss Marcia had a kinky streak. She smiled at me looked at her father and said, he's the reason I'm late. Damn, I thought, this man is going to hit me. But he didn't. He smiled at Marcia again, looked at me, said, thank you, and slammed the door in my face. Oh shit, I thought. But before I could turn around, the door opened again. It was Marcia. She reached out, took me by the shoulder and started to pull me inside saying, this is Gary Blackwell. He took me to McDonald's. That's when I realized she had brothers lots of brothers, as many as four. All of them were bigger than me, and I wasn't some shrimp. Pulling me into the house, Marcia said, This is my dad. I shook his hand. This is Ryan. I shook his hand. Robert. Another hand. John. More hands. John. More hands. And Stephen. 
The last handshake was the scariest. I realized I had been put on the spot. Then I met Helen. God, how perfect she was. I readily shook her hand. As her brothers looked me over from head to toe, her father waved me off. Nice to meet you, Gary. Come visit us again sometime. I fought back. I will. I will. I was going to ask Marcia out, but had I made a mistake? Dad looked angrier than ever. The fraternity was ready to lash out at him, but Marcia? Marcia was glowing. Hair, lip, and all, she bestowed one hell of a smile on me. Call me later. To annoy Daddy and the boys, I smiled back. Later tonight? She smiled again. At the usual time. As the door was about to close, I heard her, old man. What's the usual time? I remember skipping. I actually skipped back down their driveway to my car. Was I being stupid? Stop it! Helen spoke again. This time we were in her backyard, and I was sharpening her lawnmower. How many times have you... Uh, well? Wow, I thought to myself. I replied, twice, I've made two visits. Here's the bad part. The first time I was really scared, and the second time I thought I thought I could do it. Helen's look was annihilating. She looked just like Marcia had the night the pictures were taken. Helen, help me. I don't know what to do. I love her so much. I just want to... She's in a lot of pain, Gary. It's like it changed everything. She lowered her gaze to the mower. You don't have to do this. See, I returned the folder to my hand and held it for a second. Helen, you have to help me. She looked at the grass. Marcia is my sister, my little sister. Then looked at me. Her expression changed. You really messed up, Gary. You don't know what you did. You just don't know. She turned and walked away. I was served with a subpoena, and it was at work. I was supposed to bring my lawyer and meet with the arbitrator at the end of the month. Hell, I didn't even have a lawyer yet. I tried calling Marcia, but she didn't answer. Jamie answered. He told me that her lawyer told her to tell her to tell me to call him. I called Marcia's representative. He was no help at all. He said I should have known. I called my coworker who had warned me and he found someone. Arbitration. May we arrived at her lawyer's office around 10 in the morning. I hadn't slept at all. Tired, too much coffee, bags under my eyes. The usual signs of fatigue. It had been a long time. I'd only taken three suits when I moved, and they were already pretty worn out. I started doubling and then tripling the number of shirts to clean, taking only four ties. Socks and underwear? Well, Marcia took care of all that. I couldn't ask Helen, and she didn't volunteer. I know I need a haircut. I've started growing a beard. I quit drinking when I got married. Total abstinence. But lately I've started again, and I've still lost almost 10 pounds. Nothing fits. No one at work said anything. But ever since they found out I moved, everyone started avoiding me. They all met my wife. I became the pariah of the office. And then we met. My lawyer and I arrived at their office on time, but they still made us wait in the conference room for about 30 minutes. They couldn't have been that stupid. I was a lawyer. Then Marcia and her counselor walked in. I almost shit my pants. My stomach was churning and my nerves were going off the charts. I assumed Marcia would look as tired and miserable as I did, but she looked good. No, she looked amazing. She was wearing a lime green tight-fitting mini dress to match her eyes, a cotton jacket to match, brown shoes with two-inch heels. Her hair was styled in a long style, slightly parted to the side, no bangs, but slicked back carelessly on her forehead. She'd lost a little weight, had a little makeup on, eyeshadow, pale lipstick. Her ears were pierced, and she wore a jade, something like a crescent moon. What a metamorphosis. I aid. She looked like Emma Stone, no better than Emma Stone. The lawyer gave me the usual admonition about talking, but it didn't matter. I had to say something. My God, Marcia, you look beautiful. She blushed but said nothing. Her lawyer, an older, very respectable man I'd heard of, a real barracuda in such matters, smiled at me. We had an arbitrator with us, a woman who came with my wife and her lawyer. Not a good sign. The arbitrator smiled at me and my attorney. This is an informal meeting. We are here to discuss Mrs. Blackwell's desire to enter into a formal separation agreement. Are we all in agreement on this? My attorney nodded in agreement. Yes. I interrupted. It was stupid, I know. Marcia, can't we just go somewhere and talk? The arbitrator interrupted me. That's what we're here for. She turned to my wife and her attorney. Would you like to start? My wife's attorney began. 
Mrs. Blackwell is seeking this separation agreement because she feels uncomfortable around her husband after his infidelity, but she doesn't know if she's ready to think about divorce yet. I died inside. Divorce, he said it. He noticed it, but continued. Mr. Blackwell has caused my client severe distress and pain and terrible mental anguish. He violated their prenuptial agreement, caused Mrs. Blackwell incredible grief, and shirked his parental responsibilities. My lawyer smiled and nodded, but then I interjected into the conversation. No, wait, I didn't. My wife's attorney interrupted me. You had sex outside of marriage? Yes, but... You moved out of the house. But she asked... The arbitrator shifted his gaze from me to my attorney, to my wife and to her attorney. Is that correct? My lawyer confirmed it with a nod. I said, yes, but... The arbitrator waved me off and turned to my wife's attorney. Are you requesting an indefinite separation? At least six months, he said. I coughed. Six months. Marcia started to say something, but the lawyer put his hand over hers. He added, probably longer than that. My client has to decide what she wants to do. I am a lawyer. I had a lawyer with me. I knew the rules, but it didn't matter. I jumped up from my chair. No, Marcia, come on. I shifted from foot to foot like I needed to pee. I didn't know what to do with my hands. I stretched my arms across the table. Marcia. She backed away. My Marcia backed away from me. And the arbitrator tapped her fingernails on the tabletop. Mr. Blackwell, please sit down. My lawyer tugged on my coat sleeve. Gary. I looked across the table at my wife and her attorney. Honey. Marcia, looking away, finally spoke up. Sit down, Gary. I sat down. Marcia's attorney continued again. We are willing to continue to allow reasonable visitation with the children, and we are open to counseling. We were thinking about five sessions. I knew what this was about. I knew it before. My attorney had discussed it with me. Five sessions was the minimum. Five sessions usually meant it was settled, and we were nearing the finals. My lawyer smiled. Again. We thought ten. Her lawyer smiled back. Five. Then the arbitrator smiled as well. Based on my notes, five sessions is about right. If things change, we can add more at some point. Her notes, I thought. This wasn't arbitration. It was a lynching. I looked pleadingly at my lawyer. He ignored me and said, Okay, five. And that was the end of it. We agreed to the standard visitation procedure. One night a week and alternating days of the week. I continued to bear all expenses. The issue of alimony was not formally discussed. It was assumed that I would fulfill my responsibilities. Marcia was given an additional expense account over and above what she normally received. When I asked about this, her attorney mentioned something about social expenses, babysitters, clothes, cosmetics, and gasoline. When I asked if that meant Marcia would be going on dates, her lawyer said Marcia might need to stretch her legs from time to time. Stretch her legs? Is she walking away from me? I said, I'd like to start this counseling as soon as possible. When can we start? Marcia looked at me, but looked away after my remark. Looking at her attorney, she said quietly, I'd like to wait. Our arbitrator looked concerned. We usually like to move forward fairly quickly, but if you'd like to... My wife interjected. I need time to think about it first. Maybe in a few weeks? A few weeks, I muttered. My God, Marcia. It's been a long time since I've been home. It seems like forever. I want to come home. The arbitrator turned to my lawyer, then to me. I think we'll let Marcia set the schedule. I looked at my wife. I tried to look as pitiful as I could. Marcia, dear, please. She didn't look at me. The arbitrator looked at Marcia and her counselor again. Let's take a break for 10 weeks. I have a list of good counselors. Still looking at his wife and never once looking at me. You can check their references and calendars. When you decide, we'll set up a schedule. Finally, my attorney had something to say. Ten weeks is a very long time, and in my experience, both parties are involved in the selection of counselors. The arbitrator looked at my wife. She shook her head emphatically in the negative. The arbitrator smiled and turned to her. There is always room for compromise. Let's say a five-week break, and you choose your own counselor. Marcia still shook her head in refusal. The arbitrator suggested, Eight weeks then? Marcia looked from the counselor to the arbitrator, but not to me. She nodded affirmatively. The arbitrator leaned back in his chair. That settles the matter. An eight-week reprieve while Marcia researches and selects counsel. Marcia tapped her polished fingernails on the table. She almost never did this, but it always indicated excitement. No, 
I will begin interviewing counselors after the eight-week respite. I burst into tears. But before I could make another sound, my counselor said, That sounds fair, and of course the cost of arranging the consultations will be covered by Mr. Blackwell through my office. With those words, the arbitrator left her seat. Well, I think that went well. My wife and her attorney stood up. They each shook hands with the arbitrator. Marsha's attorney then shook my attorney's hand. We'll be in touch. My attorney turned and smiled and replied, Take your time. In a hurry, I thought. No hurry? I wanted to go home. I wanted my life back. What's going on? Marsha and her counselor went out a side door. As they stepped back, I asked, Marsha, can't we? My counselor took my hand. Not now, Gary. Let nature take its course. You'll see. It always works out in the end. We walked out of the office. My lawyer went to his Escalade. I got into my Camaro. Funny thing about cars. Before Meadow, we had a Malibu and a BMW, but Meadow meant another place, so we bought an Expedition. It didn't last long. Marsha was short and she wasn't comfortable driving it, so we bought an Explorer. But even in it, Marsha wanted something different, sporty, so we bought her a Camaro. The boys, too independent to drive with their mom, rode the bus. But when I was gone, I got a call from her dad that Marsha needed an Explorer so she could take the boys to sports. I wondered how that was going to work out. My first new evening visit came. Marsha didn't even look at me. She went upstairs. All five of us sat down at the dining room table. I tried to strike up a conversation with the boys about school, then sports, lastly video games. Nothing. Meadow was the only one. She and I talked about her writing practice and dance lessons. After about an hour, Jamie signaled his brothers and announced, Dad, we have homework. And that was the end of it. They went upstairs. I hung out with Meadow a little longer, but it was no use. My first official weekend didn't go much better. I arrived at my house on Saturday at 10 a.m. Everything was ready, and we hit the road. I tried to fit as much as I could into my allotted time. We had lunch at McDonald's, then went to a movie. Late in the afternoon, we went back to Helen's house, had dinner, watched TV, and sent them to bed. The next morning, Jamie told me they needed to go home and get ready for mass. I said I would drive them, but Jamie refused. He said it was mom's job and that I shouldn't be with her. So the weekend turned out to be a disaster. I put Helen's boy, Marion, on the program. He seemed to be the only one having fun. Even Meadow was glum and unsociable. I gave up and said, maybe next time? None of the kids said anything. I drove them home before 9 o'clock so they would have time to pack. The following weeks followed the same formula. The kids were polite and well-behaved, but it was obvious that I was becoming an outsider. I was even losing Meadow. Something was happening. I didn't know what exactly, but I couldn't imagine Marsha turning our kids against me. But I just didn't know. What was I supposed to do? As I tried to make sense of the situation, I spent a lot of time reminiscing. In the early stages of our acquaintance, Marsha certainly wasn't anyone's cat meow, but she certainly wasn't my cat meow. I liked her, but there was no love. Nevertheless, I continued to date her. In fact, since our first date, I haven't dated anyone else. At the time, I thought I was using her. How did I realize that? I figured that since I was dating this little homely lowlife, other people, especially girls, would see me as some kind of gallant guy. Which was cool. It worked. But I still didn't go out with her. I guess I felt sorry for her. Plus, I was finishing law school, and I needed time to study. It was a symbiosis of sorts. I stayed home and studied for exams, and she did her religious stuff. It turned out that either I was in her parents' house or she was in my apartment with me. Both were studying and praying, but neither of them were socializing. It was nice. She was so quiet. Something unusual in a young woman. I remembered our first real date. I had bought tickets to a play downtown. I didn't know then that her mom had taken her, and they bought a new black dress. Her first, I was told later. She was so young. Anyway, I had it all planned out. I would arrive at her house, give her flowers, knight her, take her out to dinner, then to a play, and get her home at a decent time to go have fun afterward. Nothing ever works out the way we plan. I was just about to drive off, but then some fool rushed onto the highway. He or she changed lanes too abruptly. I ended up in the back of a huge pileup. My car wasn't damaged, but I was trapped in the middle of a long string of cars. There were cell phones around, but I didn't have one yet, so there was no way I could call and warn Marcia. I didn't get to her house until an hour after the appointed time, and it was Marcia's first real date of her life. I found out about it many years later. 
Anyway, I got to her house, and although she was there, she stayed upstairs. Four brothers and my father looked at me, ready to pounce with fists. I explained what had happened. Thank goodness there is television, and the pileup was on the news. Her mom called upstairs to come down, but Marcia said she wasn't feeling well. Of course, that was total bullshit. I was in their living room in a suit and carrying an armful of cheap flowers. I grinned at Mrs. Fitzgerald. I'm tired. How about a cup of coffee? She hurried into the kitchen, and I proceeded to the dining room table, where the five Fitzgerald men were seated. And there we sat for nearly an hour. I had no intention of leaving. Marcia was dressed in an old blouse and corduroy pants that looked like they had belonged to one of her brothers years before Marcia eventually came downstairs. Her eyes, even an hour later, were still a little puffy and red. I knew she had been crying. Imagine, a first real date. She must have thought I was going to kick her out. I found out later that's exactly what she thought. I stood up. Well, come on, let's go. She was surprised. It's too late. We can't go out now. I handed her flowers, carnations, forget roses, a first date, and with a whore? I told her, We missed the play, but Sleepy Hollow is on at the mall. We'll watch the movie, and then we'll stop for pizza. So we did. Later, I didn't regret missing the play. I bought tickets for The Phantom of the Opera. I was very young and not very bright. We were in the lead at work on a hospital case, and the rest of the workload was pretty light, even too light. One afternoon, Delbert Clausen, the senior partner, summoned me to his office. Gary, he began, once we get this hospital case sorted out, we want you to take a vacation. I wondered, why? Aren't things going well? He replied, you're doing well, better than ever, but we think you need a vacation. Go on a trip, buy some new clothes, get a tan. We know you're having a hard time with your workload and household chores, but we need you to be on top of things. That bad, huh? He smiled. Yeah, plus we've got a couple big ones on the horizon, and we're going to need you. So I decided to take a little vacation. But before I left, I decided that I would try my best to win back my wife's favor, or at least find out what was going on with my kids, especially the boys. But nothing was working. I tried to get them to go to the movies with me, but nothing worked. Even Meadow wasn't interested. Something was going on. I decided to wait a few days. I kept trying. I called and called, but got rejected every time. Back at work, once my part of the hospital case was closed, I took three weeks. For two, I planned to go to the Bahamas and return for the third. Jamie's birthday was approaching. I wish I hadn't done that, but then again, the Bahamas was nice, but not for me. There were bikini girls and booze and organized parties, but my thoughts were elsewhere. I just couldn't get Marcia out of my head. I kept remembering something from our past. I thought back to the time when I think I started to realize that Marcia was more than just a hedgehog I was dragging around with me. I dated her for a few weeks without much thought. Hell, I could take her to the movies, buy her a bag of popcorn, hug her, feel good about myself like I was doing something for some underprivileged person, like a charity, and still then go out with the guys, pick up a stray and party. Yeah, I've started. Shitty? I guess so. But she didn't know. And even if she did, so what? I've been practically incognito on all our dates. I think she guessed it. She was always very excited on our first dates. She was going to go out and be with a real stud, a good-looking guy. But after a while, I realized that she realized that we weren't going anywhere, that it was all a sham. I don't remember if it was her or me, but I decided to do a little more, to take the next step. We went bowling. Honestly, she had gone bowling before, but only with her girlfriends, and that was after lunch. Real fun was a different story. She had girlfriends, sure, but they weren't real friends. People could be cruel. They girls did all sorts of things. They went to the beach. They had sleepovers. They had parties. Helen told me about it. Marcia's friends were always nice to her, but when it came to boys or any kind of social planning, she was on the sidelines. This meant that going to the beach, the pool, a party, or worst of all, a sleepover, never included her. Helen told me that once Marcia even tried to organize her own party, but all of her friends, one by one, found a reason to be absent. Did I hear that and think I was a freak? I think bowling was Helen's idea. I stopped by to pick up Marcia at the usual time and she asked, What's the movie tonight? I replied gruffly, No movie today. We're going bowling. My God, who would have thought I had proposed to her? She excitedly said, Bowling? Gee, I don't have any shoes. I replied demurely, we'll rent them, and off we went.
I realized later that we did. It was bowling that got me hooked. Marsha had never met any of my friends, and I figured bowling could be completed with a cheap burger and Coke and meeting some of my friends at the counter. We played a couple games of bowling. I was a gentleman and let her win, but also made sure she knew. We finished our games and I took her to the food stand. A few of my friends had seen us, but none of them had ever seen Marsha before. I was leading her behind me, or was it Marsha who kept behind me? Either way, she was walking behind me, as were a few of the guys. It was bound to happen. I'd even thought about it a couple times myself. Some jerk behind us made a cracking noise, as usual, put a bag over her head. I turned around and saw that Marsha had heard it. It was like looking at a puppy that someone had just kicked. I may have gone to law school and had what they call social graces, but hearing that set me back about six years. To be honest, I've never been in a fight, not once, not even once. I took a few boxing lessons when I was at university as part of my health credits, but that was it. And yet there I was, there they were, and there stood Marsha. I did and said the only thing I could think of. I shoved the son of a bitch and growled, screw you. In the old days, a knight would throw down the gauntlet. Where I grew up, it was screw you. I was amazed. The guy and his friends immediately backed off. The guy who made the remark raised his hands palms outward. Sorry, man, and looked at Marsha. Sorry, really, and they all hurried away. I threw a glance at Marsha, and holy shit, I got the look. That night, that moment, I stopped being Gary Blackwell. I became Sir Galahad. She had that look in her eye like I'd just slain some dragon. And with that look, she in that moment ceased to be the homely little ragbun I pitied. I didn't know that for sure yet. No, I hadn't gotten to that point yet. But she was just a fart and a whistle away from being the one. After that, things started to change. And what am I doing now? Hell. I gave up everything for a piece of tail that I would never wipe my ass on in normal life. I got back just in time for Jamie's birthday. I found out they were having it at the Fitzgerald. No surprise, I was okay with that, at least at first. Then I found out that Marsha had a boyfriend, so Helen said. You know, the guy she's been seeing? He'd be at the party too. So that's what happened. I got to the party a little before lunchtime. I bought Jamie a set of books. He was interested in the Civil War, so I got him Shelby Foote's three-volume military history. I wrapped them up so they were a complete surprise. Of course, it took a lot of reading, but everyone knows books are books. Jamie mentioned one of these drones once, but I brushed it off. I told him that if he wanted another toy, he could save up and buy one for himself, so I said so. Parking on the street, I walked up to the front door. In the old days, I would have walked right in, but since we had a problem, my problem, I didn't have the same old privileges. Standing at the front door, I heard a lot of yelling and screaming inside and realized it was my kids and a few of Jamie's friends. I knocked, then knocked again. On my second knock, Alan came in. He opened the door. Daddy. Then, almost as an afterthought, he stepped back and repeated even more quietly. Daddy. Hi, I said. Did you miss me? He stepped back. Mom's in the dining room. I reached down to pick him up, but he ducked away from me. I'm sorry, Dad. Mom. And Grandpa. I felt something at my back. Was it a knife? I said. Oh, I see, of course. You said in the dining room. Right. He blushed and threw himself into my arms. Daddy. I hugged him as tightly as I could without hurting him. I didn't have to guess what was going on anymore. I let go of him and headed for the dining room, but was stopped. Another man was there, and his hand was resting on Marsha's thigh. A little too possessively, it seemed to me. Marsha's father glowered. I started to puff away, thinking, well, she sure doesn't waste any time. By then, the noise had stopped and everyone was looking in my direction. I reached back and grabbed Jamie's gift and launched myself into the crowd. There were my boys, Meadow, my wife, Helen and her boy, my mother and father-in-law, my wife's two unmarried brothers-in-law, and this new man, all staring at me. Hi, I called out. Just got back from the Bahamas. Meadow shrieked, Daddy! She jumped up and rushed into my arms. I scooped her up into my arms. How is my little angel? She grabbed me into her usual smothering embrace. Missed you, Daddy, and kissed my cheek. Then, as if shaken by some electronic monitor, she leaned back. Was there some clue, and I had missed it? She whispered, You better get me down. There was intense panic in her eyes. I lowered her to the ground, thinking, What the... Marsha held out her hand like she was the queen of Egypt. Oh, hi, Gary. 
We didn't think you were coming. I replied, What? Jamie is our son. It's his birthday. I put extra emphasis on the word our. Marcia stepped back as if I had slapped her in the face. She leaned toward the man I assumed was her new man. Gary, this is Cullen Willoughby. I looked him over. I was only six feet and 200 pounds of weight. He had nothing on me, but what he did have was Marcia's hand. I held out my hand. Nice to meet you. He took mine. Nice to meet you too. We had a brief handshake contest before I twisted my hand to release the tension. I could see that he felt he had won some small victory. I glanced at Marcia. She saw it and thought so too. I added, You're dating my wife. He smiled at her, then at me. We've become friends. I looked at Marcia but couldn't understand her. I looked around again, found Jamie's present and held it out. I brought you some books, Jamie. Jamie took the package and opened it. His eyes lit up. Shelby Foote. I smiled. Yes. Marcia ignored me in the gift. Callan bought him a drone. I smirked. A toy, how cute. No one understood. Willoughby had to say something. Counselor, I heard. You're the one who prosecuted the case against Community Hospital when the unwed mother delayed taking her daughter to the hospital until it was too late. The surgeons barely had time to save her from what I hear. Yes, she's only nearly blind now. He said, I heard. I wish she had taken her baby to someone sooner. I said, too bad she didn't have insurance. He said, I've heard that medical expenses, doctor's fees, malpractice insurance are all problems we live with today, aren't they? I said, you think so? The child is still a young child. Do you think she cares? He said, don't get me wrong. I don't think the lawsuit was frivolous. I interrupted his arrogant ass. But it would have been cheaper to just leave the baby blind. No, that's not what I meant, he replied. I graciously excused myself. I'm sure you didn't mean to, but medical costs are high. This woman only makes $8 an hour. She'll never be able to afford all the procedures her little girl will need, I added. Sometimes it's hard when you're a parent without means. He surrendered. I didn't say her child shouldn't get help. I just figured that almost everyone has some kind of insurance these days. I grinned. Forget it. With the amount of money we get, the kid will be fine, and it will help my kids get into college. From the other end of the table, Mr. Fitzgerald muttered, Ambulance chaser. What a bastard. Even his sons looked surprised. I couldn't let it pass my ears. You could use one of those. I knew I shouldn't have said that as soon as it came out. I didn't look at anyone. It was just lying on the table and stinking. Mrs. Fitzgerald looked uncomfortable. She knew what I meant, and she knew I was right. But that didn't make me feel any better. That was Marcia's cue. I couldn't believe her. You missed the best part of the party. We've already sung, opened presents, and cut the cake. Would you like me to wrap up a slice for you? I shifted my gaze from her parents to her brothers, to Helen, to Cullen, and back to Marcia, and realized, regardless of whose sons and daughters were here, and that Marcia was still, at least technically, my wife. This was not the place for me. I caught Jamie's eye in the crowd. I gave him my best fatherly look and said, Careful with that drone, son. I looked at my watch. I really had nowhere to go, but I didn't want to stay at my own son's party. Well, gotta go. Gotta get to work on time. I spun in place and headed for the front door. Walking back to the car, I started thinking, again, what I did was wrong. Sure, I knew it was. But this? This shit with some other man? Marsha? Where did he come from? And my kids, her own father poisoned the well. Why would he do that? I hadn't seen Marsha do anything like that, but who knew? I'd messed up, and I guess that made all the difference. As the old Willie Nelson song goes, a woman's heart of gold turned to stone. Just as I got to my car, I heard someone behind me yell, Daddy, wait! It was Jamie. He ran up to me, out of breath. Dad, where are you going? Well, I'm... Take me with you. He was right on top of me. I figured I didn't have anything to eat here, so I went to Denny's. Okay, he said, scrambling to the side door and jumping in. From inside, he shouted, Come on! I climbed inside. Aren't you supposed to... No he interrupted. Come on, let's go. I put the key in, turned on the ignition, released the emergency brake, and off we went. The Denny's I had originally planned to visit was near my apartment, but with Jamie on board, I decided to go to the one across from the mall down the road. I looked at my boy. I'm glad you're here, but it's going to piss your mom off. So what? He said. Jamie, I admonished. 
He turned so that he was looking directly at me. His seatbelt wasn't buckled. Look, you don't understand what's going on. I shifted my gaze from him to the highway. Okay, but buckle up first. I watched as he complied with my request. Good kid, I thought to myself. Dad, you just don't know anything, and Denny's okay? Maybe you like Ruby Tuesdays better or something? How about Texas Roadhouse? I can get steak and ribs on the side, plus we eat peanuts. I smiled. You're not really hungry. He lowered himself into his seat. More to himself, he said, I have something to tell you. I ignored the remark. We drove to the roadhouse in silence. Sure enough, when we got there, they had a line. I left my name and got one of those electric pagers. The weather wasn't too bad and we decided to wait outside. I looked at my boy. Okay, what happened? This man and Grandpa and Uncle Stephen. They're out to get you. I thought, you've got my attention, and asked, Okay, what does that mean? This man is out to get Mom, and Grandpa and Uncle Stephen are helping him. I nodded. Dad, I heard him talking. He wants to marry Mom. He wants to move in with us. Wants our house and everything. You mean sell it? What? Yeah, that's what I think. I don't. He told us. You see, he has two daughters. They came to visit us. His wife ran away or something. He got divorced or they separated and... I don't know. He told his mom, but not us. My stomach churned. The man lost his wife. He's got two kids. The bastard wants a family. He wants my family. I muttered, No kidding? What does he do for a living? Did he say anything about that? Yes. He works in Richmond, but he goes to Baltimore a lot. He talks about something called the Fed. Oh my God, I shuddered. The Federal Reserve. Jamie said the Federal Reserve? Yes, Dad. He works for them. Do you know what he does? The Federal Reserve manages our money supply. Their main office is in Baltimore, but they have offices in Richmond as well. Jamie asked, Is he rich? He drives a Mercedes. The Mercedes didn't scare me. Nevertheless, I nodded. Maybe. It's the federal government. They pay good money. Jamie was very upset. He had a right to be. Daddy, I know what you did. You were wrong. I was really mad at you at first. Wilson and Alan are still mad. And Meadow, well, she doesn't understand these things. Tell me, Jamie, does your mom know how you feel? Well, sort of. She knows we didn't want to be around you. She knows that I know what you did. She doesn't know what my brothers know. How did they know? I told them, Dad, I had to... I was so mad at you, but you know. No, tell me, son. I'd like to know. Our pager sang its tune. I started to get up, but Jamie pulled me back down. Not yet. Wait. Listen. I sat back down. Okay. Listen. You're our father. Yes, you were wrong, but still. We need you. Mom needs you. Mom really needs you. Meadow needs you. Daddy? Yes. Daddy, you've been gone a long time. You're at Aunt Helen's. Mom wanted you there so she could keep an eye on you. She talks to Aunt Helen every day. She hears how you're doing. And yes, she keeps track of where you go with GPS. Daddy, you've got to do something. This person. I certainly understood why Marsha wanted me at Helen's, and I knew she was taking what I did hard. But the GPS? And this man? Son, what else do you know about this man? Grandpa likes him. Uncle Steve was the one who brought him here. Really? Yes, he's a friend of one of Uncle Steve's. They spend a lot of time together. Grandpa is very angry with you. He says you look like some kind of politician, a man named Jonathan Edwards. Who is he anyway? Grandpa says Mom should divorce you. I ignored the remark about Jonathan Edwards. What does Mom say? Come on, Dad. We're Catholic and besides. Besides what, Jamie? You know, Mom's stuff. She thinks, God, son, that was so long ago. She had surgery when she was a kid and a bunch of other procedures since then. Sure, her lips were bright red when we met, but she's had so many cosmetic procedures since then that it's almost unnoticeable. Dad, before, before what you did to that woman, mom told us about you. You know, she told us what you were like. I realize that's true and I'm not proud of who I was. What do you mean? She was telling us how great you were, how you were Superman, how you took care of her, how you made her love you, and all the nice things you did. Man, you must have been something. No kidding. She said I was really good. Dad, she loves you so much. You were perfect and then, well, now she's, I think she kind of expects you to, well, you know. Just then, Jamie was interrupted. 
Mr. Willoughby had somehow found us. Damn it, GPS. He headed over to where we were sitting. Jamie, your mom is worried about you. You just ran away. I saw my son's shoulders tense. It's okay. I'm with daddy. Well, Willoughby said. She sent me to get you back. My son stood up. I don't need you to bring me back. Daddy can do that. I looked Willoughby over from head to toe. Yeah, I thought. He likes nothing better than to report on me causing trouble. I turned to Jamie. You better let him take you back. Dad? No, just go already. I'm glad we talked. I leaned forward slightly. Keep what we said under your hat. I winked. It'll be okay. Mr. Willoughby reached out to take my son's hand. He yanked his hand away. I'll go, but don't touch me. Willoughby looked at me. He muttered under his breath. Don't make her get a restraining order. I raised my hands, palms facing Willoughby. We're fine. And turned to Jamie. I got this, kid. Just stay calm, okay? Jamie threw Willoughby a leering look, then looked at me. Sure thing, Dad. As he walked away, Jamie asked me, Daddy, who's Bonnie Tyler? I waved after them as they drove away. So what? I pondered. Where did that come from? What did Marcia say to Jamie? What does Bonnie Tyler have to do with this? And how did Marcia know about her? What was I supposed to say? Damn, that was hard. Damn it. I mean, damn it. Double damn. Where did Bonnie Tyler come from? Hell, she was what I laughingly called a throwback, a fish too small to hold. She was just a silly little girl, so caught up in ideas about love and happily ever after, that she fell for the first asshole who paid attention to her. Bonnie was exactly that. A skinny, musky girl I found in the library my senior year of college. She was studying English literature and working on an assignment on Defoe when I bumped into her. A little lowlife? I dated her? She'd fallen in love. I could have gotten her, but I just couldn't bring myself to defile someone so naive. Come to think of it, except for the lips, she looked a lot like Marcia. I remember letting her off easy. I actually had a nerd friend. I introduced them, and me, imagine that. She later called me her lucky charm. I heard they got married. I thought about it some more. I needed to pull my head out of my ass. I needed to save my own marriage. Okay, we have five sessions. That's a start. We'll see from there. Hell, nobody's gonna sell my house. Willoughby's an asshole if he thinks he can control my life. And Mr. Fitzgerald and young Mr. Stephen, aren't they pieces of work? I'll get to them too. I never ate. I took the electric monitor into the house, found my car, and went back to Helen's. Today I got a call from a lawyer. Marcia has chosen a consultant, a woman named Melody Whiting. I'll call her Dr. Whiting. We are supposed to have one individual session each, and then the last three sessions will be done together. I didn't think that's how we were going to have it. I guess I was wrong. I had one session with the counselor. It went about as I expected. She asked me the expected questions. Why we are where we are, what I want, what I am willing to do. Do I understand Marcia, all the usual? I talked for about 20 minutes and she listened and took notes. She said I would be informed when the three of us got together. As I left, she seemed somewhat dismissive. It made sense. She's Marcia's person. I didn't think this was going to be easy. We had our first session together today. It didn't go very smoothly. Marcia wasn't ready to talk, so it was mostly me. She kept saying she had a headache and just wanted to go home. Said she was feeling nauseous. Oh my God. How long has it been? I did everything I could. What could I have done? I can say, I'm sorry in six languages now. I've answered all the questions. I've tried to explain the unexplainable. Damn it. How many times do I have to explain that I can't explain how this happened? Dr. Whiting seemed bored with the whole thing. And definitely bored with me. Maybe he and Marcia had already thought it over and couldn't think of a suitable way to dump a burden on me. Marcia had decided something. Really, I think she's decided not to decide. At least not yet. I don't think she wants a divorce, but I don't think she wants me around. At least at the moment. It doesn't make much sense, but then it does. She's working up the courage to make some kind of final decision. I'm willing to work things out, but her? If she would only say something. I spoke to Helen last night. She said she thinks Marcia is thinking about divorce, but she said there's something else she can't tell me. Also, this Willoughby character seems to be gaining momentum. Marcia is stalling for time. Helen says that none of the kids like him, but that just makes Marcia more determined. Helen says her father likes Willoughby. She says she's never seen her father so sure of anything. That last one gave me an idea. Marcia's father is a cop. 
Two of his sons are cops, and the other two work in law enforcement in other capacities. I always knew he was digging into my past. He always knew about my spotty juvenile history and some of the things I was indirectly involved in in college. Of course, juvenile cases are supposed to be closed, but we all know better. So, as a kid, I used to steal cars. Hell, I didn't even have a license back then. And high school. It was a place where guys went to hit on girls. College wasn't exactly smooth sailing for me, either. I never broke any laws, but there were times when I was around. A few girls tried to accuse me. I could have been in the house, could have known what was going on, but I always managed to stay out of shit like that. Still, my name is on the rumor. There was an investigation and I was questioned. Yeah, he had a lot of good reasons to keep me away from his daughter. I guess four grandchildren, a big house, the fact that she'd never have to work didn't matter. I remembered her father, that bastard. When Marcia and I first started dating, Mr. Fitzgerald, after his initial resentment, had sort of backed off. I can see it now. When I took Marcia to places where it didn't matter, he backed off. But after bowling and when I started dragging her to places where we were seen together, he became not exactly hostile, but less friendly, more uncooperative, constantly putting up little roadblocks. I bet he noticed the change. The change in me, and then in Marsh. Mr. Fitzgerald, he's Irish. I thought the Irish were supposed to be emotional and testy, quick to anger but just as quick to forgive. Mr. Fitzgerald was not like that with me. He was cold, no, not cold, but calculating and always wary. He's the same with his wife. She's like a slave to him. Come to think of it, no one was allowed to disagree with him. His opinion, his approach, has always been the one. God, Marsha was like a little puppy when I first started dating her. She was his favorite until I came along. That's when she started to get savvy. I stood up to him, and she was the only one to take my side. I remember it now. I was proud of her, and I could see she was proud of herself. My thoughts were insane. That bastard had treated Marsha like a cripple her whole life. She was supposed to be his gift to the church. And then I got in the way. Helen said Marsha thought I was promoting children, which I wish I was. Let me put it this way. The relationship with the children has not been good the last few visits. Wilson and Alan are acting surly. Meadow is starting to lose her temper. Jamie is just watching me. He's waiting for something. I think I should do something. I just wish I knew what. Jamie and I text a lot. He uses Meadow's cell phone. He says it's the only one Marsha doesn't check. Jamie expects me to do something. I know he is. I just don't know what. I keep trying to apologize, but Marsha won't listen to me. Jamie gave me a good tip. He said his mom and this Willoughby guy go out to eat a lot, maybe twice a week. That's a lot. Sounds like a total squeeze. Jamie said his mom talked him into taking her alternately to either Grotto or Olive Garden. Grotto specializes in seafood, and of course there's Olive Garden, but it's a big deal. Those are the places we used to go. After thinking about it, I got Jamie on the phone, and it wasn't easy. We made a deal. Every time Marsha and Willoughby go somewhere, he has to text me and let me know where they are going. He firmly stated that he doesn't love the man and wants me to come home. We agree. What a great kid. Jamie replied that they were headed to the grotto. I called and verified that they were indeed headed there, and that since there were no booths, Willoughby had made a reservation. I made a reservation as well. I drove ahead and pulled up to the establishment just in time for the intended couple. I watched as he helped her out of his car, a gray Mercedes, of course, and sat her down in it. I followed him. The restaurant was divided into several rooms. They were in the largest room. I was nearby in the smaller one. Unlucky, but lucky in the sense that I was sitting by the window and could watch the parking lot. Realizing that my original plan to disrupt their slumber by eating in front of them wasn't going to work, I came up with an alternative plan. I waited 10 minutes and called for the waitress. I pointed out where the suspicious couple was sitting and ordered a plate of stuffed mushroom caps and a plate of oysters and half shells covered with imperial crab from the appetizer menu to send to them. I chose these dishes because she and I always ordered them. I asked the waitress to tell them it was from an old friend who was dining nearby. I had no idea what effect my suggestion had, but less than 10 minutes after ordering, the waitress reappeared with two plates. She told me that the couple was grateful, but had decided to decline my gift. Not five minutes later, I watched from my table as Mr. Willoughby helped my wife back into the car. I was disappointed. I had hoped for more. I can't say what, just more. I grimly assumed they would move on to a more hospitable diner. I was still hungry, so I ate the appetizers, followed by the grilled salmon. Good news. 
As I sat dejectedly finishing the last of the fish, I got a text message. It was from Jamie. Mr. Willoughby had just dropped Marsha off. Mom, he said, was upset about something. I replied that I did. He replied, UGD. Not being a textual language expert, I guess that meant, you go dad. I knew I had one true ally. Two nights later, Jamie alerted me that they were heading to Outback Steakhouse. Yep, new place. This time I got there first and took a seat at the entrance. Marcia spotted me as they walked in. She turned pale and they left. An hour later, I received a message from Jamie. He had been grounded and stripped of all phone privileges. I recognized the source of his message. He was using Alan's phone. Oh yeah, a new friend? Intercepting my wife and her villainous accomplice in restaurants was one thing, but I needed more. As I mentioned, Marcia was volunteering at St. Tim's School, where our children attended. She would arrive with Meadow and return when Meadow finished her day. It was time to apply even more pressure. I flooded St. Timothy's with a variety of gifts, some of which were for Marcia, but a few were for the school as well. We weren't rich by any standard, but some things I could afford. I ordered new laptops for the secretaries where Marcia kept her coat. It was only four computers, but she must have noticed that they arrived as gifts from me. Marcia wasn't short on attention either. She loved flowers, roses. Now my wife could be described as something ethereal, if that word can even be used as a noun. One day, a week, I made sure she received a dozen long-stemmed roses. On Monday, she got yellow ones. The card said, Friendship. Tuesday came an orange one labeled, Passion. Wednesday, the signature red ones with the phrase, I love you. Thursday, the pink ones with our children's names. And Friday, the white ones with the Lincoln quote, Love is eternal. I knew my Marcia. If she didn't already know, she checked the meaning of each color. Okay, I pleaded. What else was there to do? On Saturday, while Helen was mowing the lawn, a delivery man showed up with a large cardboard box, inside of which were five dozen roses, all crumpled and wrinkled. At least I tried. Jamie bought a discarded cell phone. We made an appointment to meet after school. When I got there, I found Wilson was there too. Jamie began. First, before we start, Meadow and Alan don't know anything, but Will, we called Wilson Will, and I do. I replied, Okay, what do we know? Jamie added, Mr. Willoughby's wife lives in Richmond. She left him and moved in with another man. She left him and her daughters. I already knew this. I had hired a private agency. Jamie continued, I don't think it's about money or mom or anything else. I think Mr. Willoughby just wants a new family. He has daughters. We know them. Wilson interrupted. They're daddy piggies. They're both in middle school and think their shit doesn't stink. Don't call them pigs, son. Wilson looked at Jamie. See? That's daddy for you. Jamie grinned at his brother. He said you'd protect them, he continued. Mr. Willoughby comes over all the time now. Sometimes he brings his daughters. Sometimes he leaves them at home. They kind of make fun of Meadow so she doesn't like them. I started. They laugh. Not in front of mom, Jamie added. Wilson said, they tease her about her room and stuff. You know, stuffed animals and clouds and stuff. I asked, clouds, Marcia. Yeah, Jamie replied. Painted on the walls, I finished my sentence. Jamie continued, they play Scrabble, and he lets her win. I argued, she's always used. Wilson, yeah, Dad, but she really beat you. He's smarter than that. He knows a lot more words. Wilson, Mom says different things. I asked, like what? Wilson replied, he asks her about something and she talks about you. She tells him how you were never home before. You worked all the time. You never had time. I got angry. Damn it, that's not true. I came home every night. Sometimes I was late, but I always had a reason. Jamie said, Mom told him it was because you were out with... I blurted out, You know that's not true. Wilson smiled. We know, Dad. Jamie looked around. Oh, he nodded toward the parking lot. Mom, I turned and saw her crossing the parking lot. I looked at my boys. I guess the meeting is over. We were sitting in the bleachers. They both jumped up and ran. In unison, they yelled, See ya! I yelled back, Yeah, soon! As my boys climbed into the car, I saw Marcia scolding them. I thought about what they had told me. My sources described pretty much the same thing. Willoughby was a top-level administrator at the Federal Reserve. He was making excellent money, but his wife had abdicated her duties. About the wife, I wasn't surprised. Teenage girls often exhibit antisocial behavior, directed mostly at their mothers. 
and the stress may have overwhelmed her. Then the second part. She found herself a younger, richer guy. Willoughby wasn't a predator, though he better be. No, he was a victim, a prey seeking refuge, and he certainly saw Marcia for what she was a caring helper, a person always willing to shelter a helpless puppy. And so he found the perfect home. Three well-behaved boys, a charming daughter, and a woman who found fulfillment in helping others. There was only one problem. It was my home. It was my boys. It was my adorable daughter. And the woman he wanted was my wife. We had a second session. I was lost. It felt like everything I had and everything I would ever have was slipping away. No attempt to reason with me. No entreaties, promises, or vows worked. I chose the only path left. I begged, I pleaded, I pleaded, I cried, I got on my knees. I begged her to forgive me. I begged her to let me come home, to let me dedicate my life to making her happy. I talked to the stone. At the end of our last session, after 40 minutes of stone-cold silence, Marcia finally made a statement. She said, I can't and won't forget what you did. I don't forgive you and I never will, ever. She said. I replied, I've said it a hundred times. I love you. I made a mistake. I want to make it right. Can't you at least say something to me? Say something other than this unforgiveness. She killed me. Okay. Okay. I'll say a few things. First of all, how do I know what you say is true? You said this is the only time. How do I know that? You work late a lot. You travel. You get calls at odd hours and never say who they're from. Sometimes you come home and I smell perfume. Sometimes it's lipstick. My dad told me you're out all the time. His cop friends told him they saw you with women. Sometimes you'd come home and you'd be too tired for me. My dad's right. You're a womanizer. You've never been honest with me. You're a cheater. I just never thought about it until it happened. Wow. I replied, Marcia, you know that's not true. Some of my clients have been women. You know that. How many times have I come home almost in tears because some crazy woman was throwing a tantrum in the hospital with a baby? My God, Marcia. You know this last case was emotionally draining. You even met the mom. You saw her hugging and kissing me, thanking me for taking on her daughter's case. That's not philanthropy. That's good lawyering. I got angry. You remember the old lady with the farm, don't you? Remember how the so-called businessman talked her into signing the deed to sell the property and how he lied? You remember how she stayed overnight at our house and was so upset. You have to remember how she clung to me and hugged me and how she sobbed on our shoulders. God, Marcia, we won that case. You have to remember that. She wasn't listening. I fired another shot. Remember the college girl who was almost swindled out of her trust fund by a dodgy relative. Remember I told you how we beat that bastard at his own game and got her money back. You remember? You remember how she offered herself to me and how you and I laughed at that offer? She growled. My father said you accepted her offer when it was over. Marcia. I couldn't believe her. Gary, she added. I don't know what to say. You told me that woman was nothing. That what you did meant nothing. Don't you understand? It meant everything. It was my whole life. It was all that mattered. She took a deep breath and continued. Gary, I love you. I have always loved you. I will love you until the day I die. But you have slept with at least one other woman. You have broken our solemn vows. You committed adultery. Once you cheat, you always cheat. Stunned, stumped, I said, Marcia, we can make this right. With the sound of a slap, her palms came down on the table. No, no, we can't. It's like the candy dish that broke that Easter. It shattered. We tried to glue it back on, but it didn't matter. It was broken. This one broke. She raised her left hand to show me the wedding rings. She then stood up, thanked Dr. Whiting, and walked off stage left. Dr. Whiting smiled at me. At least she said something, and that's something. I looked at her. I don't know what to do. I just don't know. And I didn't. The doctor surprised me. Mr. Blackstone, your wife loves you. But you're missing something. I've heard your story, how you met, the courtship, the problems. I know you feel like it's over. But don't you think it's time to stop apologizing and try something different? I asked. Like what? She looked at me like I was some kind of moron. You want her back. Try something that works. I was dumbfounded and said, Sure, but how do I do that? She smiled. You don't know? You're the knight, not me. We shook hands, and that was the end of it. One last session, one last chance. Was that really all there was? 
On the way home, I admit I almost cried. Okay, I was panting, but I was also thinking. What was I supposed to do? How could I get her back? What could work? What the hell could it be? I thought about things from our past. Hell, getting her to agree to marry me was something. It really started after bowling. I remember what the guy at the bowling alley said had a downside. It kind of knocked the wind out of Marsha's sails because bag on her head was not a new phrase to her. In fact, even her brothers had used it in reference to her a few times. Too bad now I sometimes don't know which one. Getting her to go to more public places was not easy. I wasn't an expert at any of the things we did, but I had quite a bit of experience. We rollerbladed, skied, and went fishing. We went to the beach, and with that pale, creamy skin she got burned on, we went to town carnivals, we went everywhere. Sometimes I had to literally drag her out of the car, but after a while I felt proud. Sure, people noticed her and looked at her lips, but they saw other things too. I made sure of that. It took some time, but not as much as you'd think. After a while, she really became a little extrovert, giggly, and funny. Marsha has always been a beautiful girl. Well, to me, to others, maybe not right away, but she is growing into people. She's petite, well-shaped, graceful, and very feminine. I'd say simpering, sparkling, if you can call it that. She must be. And then she agreed to marry me. Brother, it was Donnybrook. I had to talk her into it first. She was planning to become a nun. It took forever to talk her out of it. And frankly, while I was thinking about it, we had no premarital fun, none at all. There were church people who I thought were trying to get in the way. I couldn't and still can't say for sure. But perhaps Marsha's father was behind it. Mr. Fitzgerald was from a large family. One of his brothers became a priest. I had a feeling that Mr. Fitzgerald, his priest brother, and one of the parish sisters who had been around Marsha since she was a little girl, were trying to get the whole old gang on her, indoctrinate her that she was destined for the ministry and all that. Someone decided she needed counseling. For what, I can't say, but after each visit to the church counseling center, she became a little chilly toward me, not knowing what she wanted. Once she agreed to the absurd idea of marrying me, I had to face her mom and dad. Her mom surprised me. She was pleased, but her dad, oh no. Mr. Fitzgerald gave every reason he could think of. She was too weak, too frail. If she got pregnant, she'd never be able to carry the baby to term. I was too big a man. I expected too much. I hurt her, physically and emotionally. She was still sick in many ways and needed constant medical care. She had a heart defect as a child, but that was in the past. He said she would never be able to run a household. People would take advantage of her. In his final outburst, he angrily reminded me that she had devoted herself to the church. I knew that was his strongest point. I was stealing his gift to God. His gift, as he said. I'd managed to get by with everything but that. And that's where I hit a snag. Marcia, I told them, was a natural mother. She needed to bear children. Any other occupation would be a failure for her. I agreed. Marcia loved children. She loved being around them. I had her. She was in. But he had one last argument, and he used it. He proved to her that I was no good. He posted my college transcript. I had no defense other than what she and I had done, and he even compromised that with proof that I had fooled around during our first dates. Yeah, that's what happened. It was over. He had exposed me. I remember a flicker of doubt in her eyes. It looked like we were toast. And that's when Marcia picked up the spear. She took my side. I was surprised, genuinely amazed, and incredibly proud. She became Boudica, the warrior queen of the Iceni, the Celtic war goddess of Andarda. I can still hear her saying, I don't care. I love him. He's a fighter just like you, Daddy. I'm going to marry him. He's what I want. All I want. I want to make him babies and I want a big wedding with a long white dress, and a veil, and rings, and a big bouquet, and bridesmaids, and a ring bearer, and a flower girl, and a big reception with an open bar. I said I want an open bar so I can drink champagne. I want to throw a bouquet. I want all of that, all of that. I want the whole show. Then she looked at me. And I want to go to Niagara Falls on our honeymoon. And we did. That's it. What am I supposed to do now? I was so confused and confused. What am I supposed to do? Maybe someone could give me a clue? Well, this was going to happen. The third and final session. It was scheduled for the week right after the second. But I needed time. Both Dr. Whiting and Marcia agreed to wait. In the meantime, I was finding it harder and harder to reach my children. 
Helen said Meadow was told what had happened, and she recoiled from me. Alan found out about it through Meadow, and that's how I lost him. Jamie and Wilson were still around, but I could feel the change. Wilson had taken a fancy to Willoughby, and even Jamie started talking about how he was helping his mom. I was losing my family. Marcia loved me. I knew that, but she couldn't or wouldn't seem to get over what I'd done. She had help, that's for sure. Her father and Willoughby were on top of it. It hit me. Even if we get back together, there's no end to it. She'll never forget, and I'll spend the rest of my life apologizing. I'm not cut out for this. Then, there were the kids. As it happened, my children were growing apart from me. Marcia was right. The candy plate was broken. If I wanted to stay close to my kids, I'd have to change my relationship. She could have Willoughby. He needs someone anyway. He'd get her and play the role of daddy. I would have backed off and distanced myself. I'd become a more distant acquaintance, a day dad who let everyone down, but would still be a phone call away if they needed money or anything else. But for this one, I saw no other alternatives. That led to the last one. Marcia was too good a Catholic to divorce, and I loved her too much to let her drown in grief and anger for the next 40 years. After all, there was still Willoughby. Better to let her go, she'd get over it, and maybe marry a man from the government. So I decided. If she didn't want a divorce, I would. I called and got another extension. This time I was told that was it. No more postponements. I agreed to it. The last time I went to confession. I told the priest who listened to me that I was leaving the church. Of course, all this about being with Helen had to come to an end. I sat her down at the table and told her I was moving out. When she asked where I was going to live, I told her the truth. I was leaving the law firm in Richmond and moving out on my own. When she asked where, I said maybe Charlotte, maybe Pittsburgh, I don't know. She laughed. I didn't know. I then called a lawyer who referred me to the dead end I was in. It really wasn't his fault. I knew who to blame. However, I didn't like his comments and unsubscribed from him. I went online, found another person and laid it all out for him. I had come to a decision. Finally, it was time for the last session. I walked with papers in hand. I had come to the decisive moment. I would become a man. Total victory or total annihilation. The third session, a momentous day had arrived. This meeting, remembering Marcia's discomfort at the first session, was, like the second, scheduled for late afternoon. Right on time, with papers in hand, I waited patiently in Dr. Whiting's far office. Everything was ready. In the morning, I had received the divorce materials from the new attorney and packed the few personal belongings that Helen had had the night before. All that remained was to hand the papers to Marcia. She could take them or not. If she would accept them, if she would let me, I would kiss her goodbye and pay off the doctor. Either way, she would get what she wanted, but on my terms. I sat quietly and waited. The papers we drew up were more than fair. The house, her car, alimony, medical care, a generous personal allowance, temporary funds for emergencies, and a new phone number in case she needed to contact me personally. And so I waited. Was I happy? No, I was unhappy. But I knew we couldn't go on like this. It was the only thing left for us to do. But 20 minutes after the appointed time, Dr. Whiting came out. Mr. Blackwell. I stood up. Yes. Please come inside. I followed her, but not to where we had met before, but to her private office. As soon as we sat down, she said, Excuse me, Mrs. Blackwell called a few minutes ago. She won't be able to make it. I asked, Did she reschedule? Dr. Whiting replied, No. Did she say anything? We need to reschedule. We have an obligation to finish these classes. Dr. Whiting's face was impassive. No. She said she wasn't coming back. When I reminded her of what you said, she said she didn't care. She's not coming back. I backed up slightly. What am I supposed to do? I wondered. I frowned and looked at the doctor. I suppose I should call my lawyer. Have him call her. Reschedule the appointment. Nodding at the folder in my hand, Dr. Whiting asked, I see you have something in there. May I ask? No, absolutely not. I gave up. She's won. It's the divorce papers. I guess I'll have to hire someone to serve them on her. Dr. Whiting fiddled with a letter opener then some papers on her desk. Yeah, I guess, she stood up. I'm sorry. We both walked to the door of her office. She opened it to let me out. I wouldn't presume, but you're still only separated. There are no legal restrictions. You can see her, you can serve her papers yourself. I looked at the papers in my hand. I don't know. Dr. Whiting added, you don't have to give them to her. You can visit her, 
Just keep the papers handy or leave them in the car. Still looking at my papers, I replied, I suppose I can do that. Dr. Whiting tried to smile. Call me. I shook her hand. I'll let you know. So I left the doctor's office and went outside again. What to do now? I figured Helen had kept Marcia in the loop. She knew I had packed my things. She knew I was leaving. What did she think I was going to stand there, crying and whining at the last session and do nothing? I walked to my car, got in it, started it up, and drove off. My stomach was tied in a knot. I was nervous and stressed. The trip to my old house was in the balance. When I got there, Jamie and Wilson, who preferred to take the bus, were already home. Marcia, I knew, would be arriving soon, too. I went upstairs and knocked on the door. After a moment's wait, Jamie appeared. Dad, he looked surprised. Are you supposed to be here? I need to see your mom. She's not home yet. I could tell Jamie didn't know what to say or do. Look, I'll be outside, I pointed to my car. He looked scared. Was he going to cry? He nodded. Okay. As I started to walk back down the driveway, he called out to me. You know mom was really down. She cried all night. I looked back. I know. He just stood at the door and looked at me without saying anything. I wondered where Wilson was. Walking back to the car, I waited. It didn't take long. Marcia pulled up. I got out. Meadow and Alan got out of her car, saw me and started to run up, then stopped, then Meadow rushed forward, Alan followed. Meadow rushed to me. Daddy, Daddy, come home, please don't go. She wasn't crying, but one wrong word from me, and I hugged her tight. I kissed her and said, it was never up to me. Alan was beside me. Hi, Daddy. I reached out and ruffled his hair. Hi, Alan, are you okay? I think I'm fine. Mom's crying again. I looked at the road. She was still sitting in the car, hands gripping the steering wheel, eyes staring straight ahead. I put Meadow down, knelt down in front of them, and said, You guys go inside. With eyes wider than saucers, they both nodded and walked to the front door. Jamie held it open for them. I walked over to Marcia. I tapped on the side window. She looked up at me. I couldn't figure out what it was. Fear? Anger? Sadness? Marcia, this is it. We need to talk. She turned away. She covered her face with her hands. Through the window, I couldn't tell if she was crying or not. Marcia, I said, open the door and come out. She looked out again. There were tears in her eyes. She was frightened. She said through the window, step away from the door. I stepped back. She went out but took hold of the doorknob. Helen said you were leaving. God, I thought, this is it. What am I to say now? I replied, that's right. She leaned her back against the car door. She was wearing a traveling film, and she was wearing a pastel-colored slip dress, something like a muted gold, very light brown. It suited her very well. She looked beautiful, but tired. There were shadows under her eyes as if she'd been crying. There was hardly ten inches between us. I lifted my left arm slightly. Don't lean back like that. You'll stain all your pretty dress. She collapsed into my arms and started crying. I held her for a few seconds while she came to her senses. She stood up and stepped back slightly. Fully straightening up, jutting out her jaw and squaring her shoulders, she said, I told Dr. Whiting I couldn't make it today. I could see she was coming around quickly. I wondered, has the moment passed? I replied, I know. Aplomb was restored and she, in full control of herself, stated, You shouldn't have come here. For a few seconds I actually believed I had a chance. But now? I said, I have something I need to give you and started walking back to my car to retrieve the package. She took a step in my direction, then stopped. No. Wait. I turned around. I didn't say anything. I just stood there. She knew what it was. What was she going to do? Would it really end right here on the front lawn? She stood there like a cow liga. I'm pregnant. I knew it. I suspected it back at the first counseling session when she told me she was sick. I saw how she was dressed and how she looked in the second session. She was now wearing a loose-fitting shirt. More importantly, they say that pregnant women seem to glow, as if they have extra moisture or some extra oil that they secrete. Marcia had. It had always been that way. It had been that way four times. It was like that now. I replied, I think I realized that in our first session. She looked puzzled, but only for a split second. Yes, I think you knew. Why didn't you? I stopped her. This was about you, not me about what you want. She sighed. Can you come over tomorrow? I'm really tired. I need to... 
I interrupted her again. No, I won't come tomorrow, but I will. I'll help you into the house. I'll help you get into bed. I checked my watch. Then I'll make the kids something to eat. Later tonight or tomorrow we can work things out. She nodded. She really was tired, exhausted. I guessed she had been up all night. I put my hand on her shoulder. She didn't resist. I led her down the sidewalk to the front door and walked in. Jamie, Wilson, and the other two were waiting. Help me get your mom upstairs. None of them did anything but walk beside me. I half carried, half led her up the steps. When I got her to our bed, I threw back the covers and the top sheet. All the children were in the room with us. I said, guys, wait downstairs. They left and I helped her take off her dress and bra and put her in bed. When I went to the window to lower the curtain, she whispered, I just need some sleep. I'll be fine soon. You'll wait, won't you? I turned around and replied, not sternly, but smartly. I'll be downstairs. I stepped to the door, closed it, and went downstairs. As soon as I was downstairs, they came at me. Wilson was first. Aunt Helen called and said you were leaving. Jamie said, she said you were going to divorce your mom. Alan and Meadow just stared. And then Alan said, mom cried all night. She called grandpa and grandma and grandpa came over. They had a big fight. Good news? I thought so. I smiled and raged a little, but in a joking way. Mom's going to take a vacation. What do you guys say to pizza? How about a movie? Meadow exclaimed. Frozen. Jamie frowned. We all have homework. I waved him off. Not today. Wilson rolled his eyes. Alan looked embarrassed. I said, how about Maleficent? Jamie frowned. Okay. Alan grinned widely. Wilson shrugged and Meadow exclaimed, great. So I ordered three large pizzas. We watched Maleficent, then an old John Wayne movie, which I liked. I was about to put on another John Wayne when I realized no one else was awake, so I put them all to bed. The next day was school, but I told them not to worry about homework since we would all be taking the day off. I didn't argue. After putting the kids to bed, I checked on Marcia. She was sound asleep, so I grabbed a pillow and blanket, went downstairs and curled up on the couch. Closing my eyes, I swore that either way tomorrow, this nightmare would be over. I woke up to the smell of hot coffee. Looking over to the end table, I recognized its source. From across the room came Marcia's voice. Jamie said you gave the kids the day off. Yes, I did, she asked. Care to explain why? Not until I've had some of this coffee. I picked up the mug and took a big sip. It was hot. I muttered, delicious. Marcia repeated, why don't you explain now? Sure, why not? It's a beautiful day. The sun is shining. There's not a cloud in the sky. She interrupted me. How would you know? You just woke up. I checked the weather forecast last night. It was supposed to be a perfect day, so... She tried to interrupt me again. Shut up. No, I cut in. You shut up. We're all going to get cleaned up and dressed. At least you all are. I'll wear what I'm wearing now, and then we'll all go for a ride. Go for a ride? And go where exactly? For starters, down the I-81 highway to the Luray Caves. If we have time, we'll stop at the museum near VMI. If not, we'll spend the night in the Hamptons and do it tomorrow. We might even stop in Bedford and visit the Normandy Memorial. Did you know? She cut me short. You've already got it all planned out, haven't you? I nodded. Yes. Well, she said, standing up. You shouldn't even be here. I leaned back in my chair and objected. I should be. She replied. I think you should leave. I took another sip of coffee. Maybe you should come over and sit down. She became so belligerent, her arms thrown up. If you don't leave, I'll be forced to call. I quashed that suggestion before it was even uttered. I pointed to the seat next to me on the couch. Come here and sit down. What? You heard me. Come here. I'm not going. I started to get up to call out to her. I said. She came over and sat on the far edge of the couch. What do you want? I replied, no, Marcia. The question is, what do you want? She replied, I want you to leave. I snapped back. That's not what I meant. She started to open her mouth, but I continued. The way I see it, you have three options. The first, you can keep your family together. Let me raise my children with you and give our fifth child you're carrying the father he or she is entitled to. Two, you can actually demand that I leave. But in that case, you'll get the papers I have in my car and then it really will be over. Or third, you could pretend you still hate me, but then you'd never forgive me, continuing to wallow in self-pity. That last one, by the way, I won't allow. 
You think you're something, don't you? She replied. I replied, I don't think. I know. I know I'm a father of four children, with a fifth coming soon. I know I'm your husband. I know you love me, and I know I'm an imperfect man. She was seething. I was pleased to see that. She said, You think you can come in here after what you did and dictate terms to me? I replied, Yes, and I just did. So what are they going to be? She just sat there looking at me. I waited what I thought was a sufficient amount of time, stood up and said, I'm going to go get my papers. She got up and stood in front of me. You betrayed me. You broke our vows. You lied to me. I replied, I betrayed you. I have broken our vows. I committed adultery and even lied to you about stealing your car. But I apologized over and over again and vowed never to do anything like that again. Now if you step aside, I'll go get the papers and we'll be done with this. I stepped aside to get to the door. She stepped aside as well and blocked my path again. You think I can forgive you and everything will go back to normal? And what makes you think the baby I'm carrying is even yours? I stopped. I put my hands on her shoulders and said, You're a Christian. You have to forgive me. And no, things will never go back. But we can and will move on, either together as a family or separately. And about our fifth child. I know she or he is mine because I know you. Besides, I know when it happened. So what's it going to be? A new reboot where we pick up the broken shards of the candy dish and really fix it? Or a clean, once-and-for-all breakup? I took a step to the side again and headed for the door. This time, she didn't try to intervene. I guessed that it really was over. As I reached the door, I heard her say quietly, Why don't we start at Harper's Ferry and spend a week there? I stopped at the door. Over the next few days, things worked out differently. We did start at Harper's Ferry and stood at the Jefferson Stone. We drove down to Bedford and saw the D-Day Memorial, toured Luray Caverns, the VMI Museum, and wrapped things up with a walk to the Natural Bridge. Jamie took along a Shelby foot book I had given him, and we went through the section on the Battle of the VMI. We all laughed at the many movies that told about it in one form or another. Even Marsha was laughing. So what did Marsha and I do? First, we needed to borrow her dad's minivan. She went to get it, but I insisted on going with her. I waited outside while she went into the house and got the keys. No one came out. No grandmother or grandfather. I confess I wanted to fight. Did every night we stayed at either the Hampton or the Marriott, so we had a good breakfast every morning and clean linens every night. We rented two rooms, one for the boys and one for Marcia, Meadow, and me. The first night I had to get up a couple times to keep the boys in line. We were gone for four nights and five days. School didn't matter. It was what we did that mattered. For each night, we rented rooms with two double or large beds. The first night, Marcia and Meadow slept together, and I slept next to them. On the second night, Marcia was so tired and exhausted from walking that she lay with me while I massaged her back. The third night was a repeat of the first, but this night, Marcia let me listen to our baby's heartbeat. I could also feel him or her move. On the last night, after I gave her a massage, Marcia and I sort of cuddled and snuggled together. In all this time, Meadow never once tried to join us in bed. Every day I saw her with the boys. I think they discussed what they should say and how Meadow should behave at night. No one talked about the fact that we were having problems. Final showdown. When we got home, we put the kids to bed, and then Marcia and I had a little conversation. She began, I don't think I can ever forgive you, Gary. You hurt me. You hurt me very badly. I replied, I know. I know I hurt you. I apologized for a long time and begged you to let me come home, but I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. I'm incomplete. I'm imperfect. I broke the dish. It can't be fixed, but it can be replaced. That's a lot to ask, Gary. I don't know. I do know, Marcia. We're Christians, honey. She tried to interrupt me. Don't call me. I interrupted her. I'll call you honey. You're my favorite. Nothing you say can stop that from happening. Where was I left off? We are a people who believe. God is forgiving. Of course we are not God, but we must try. Jesus offered eternal life to a convicted criminal when they were both on the cross. Peter lied and denied Christ not once, but three times. What did Jesus say and do, Marcia? She remained silent, so I told her. He found Peter on the water when he was fishing. He asked Peter three times, Do you love me? Three times Peter answered that he did. Jesus forgave Peter three times. He forgave him three denials. Peter failed, but Jesus forgave. I failed Marcia. If you can't forgive and let me go home, then I have to leave. Is that what you want? 
Is that what you want me to do? Do you want me to leave so you can marry Cullen Willoughby? At this, she rolled her eyes. Maybe if you come home and stay downstairs. I replied, No, if I come home, I'll sleep with my wife. She stammered, You wouldn't. You couldn't. I told her, If I come home, I will come all the way home. I would want the whole package deal. I want my children, my home, my wife, and I would expect to enjoy the love and intimacy that comes with marriage. She muttered, Well, I guess. I said, No, Marcia, no guessing. If we agree, we agree to the end. I'll probably still be mad at you from time to time. I expected that. I'd be surprised if you didn't. I guess I'll have to talk to Colin. Yes, I said. You will have to. He'll be disappointed. This is my family, not his. You're my wife, not his, and your mom and dad. She interrupted me. I've already worked it out. Are you sure? Yes. What about your brother Stephen? She replied, I'll take care of him. I said, good. I'll call Dr. Whiting and pay any remaining legal fees. She then finished, you'll never. I stopped her. No, never. You can count on it. I took her hand in mine. It was time for a fresh start. We went upstairs and got into bed. Epilogue. A few weeks later, our fifth child was born, a little girl. We named her Mary Elizabeth after a girl who was a saint for her qualities of forgiveness and the mother of John the Baptist. Of course I love all my children, but I would be a liar if I didn't admit that Mary Elizabeth holds a special place in my heart. About us, about Marsh, and about me. It was still hard for her. I wasn't just the guy she married, I was her Prince Charming. I broke a lot more than a plate of candy. It's been a while and we're still working on it, but we have kids and most importantly we have each other. And what about me? Me? Oh yeah. What did I need to do? I needed to stand up and be a man. I needed to take a stand and stand or fall based on what I want and what I believe in. I learned a lot about myself. I learned a lot about courage. There are different kinds of courage. A police officer risks his life when he goes on a raid for criminals. A fireman rushes into a burning building to save a helpless child. A soldier puts on his uniform and goes to war. I have never run into a burning building. I never wore any kind of uniform. I never fired a rifle or a pistol, not even when hunting. But still, I had to make a decision. I was scared, I tell you, but I had to risk everything to get everything, and I won. But I was lucky. I had a wife who loved me. That's all. See you later. The end. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. So subscribe to my channel and watch the next video.